Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's a great pleasure to have with us uh, Matei Shiokarli. Matei um, is professor at Columbia University. Um, Matei has actually won pretty much all the early career awards that you can possibly win. He won the NSF Career, won the Sloan uh, Fellowship, he won the ONR Young Investigator Award, he won the IEEE Robotics Automation Society Young Investigator Award, and probably many more. Um, he did his PhD before that also at Columbia, working under uh, Peter Allen at the time. Um, then spent a few years at Willow Garage uh, as a research scientist and program manager there, um, making a lot happen that kind of many of us still benefit from today. I mean, Ross and PR2 were built at Willow Garage. And we're very happy to have him with us today. Please join me in welcoming uh, Matei. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Peter, for hosting me. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's, it's so good to be here. Um, I will talk to you today about our work on robotic manipulation. Not only manipulation. We're getting a little bit into other kinds of motor control as well. And the central theme throughout most of what we do is contact. Uh, contact, which is underappreciated, if, it's, if that's even possible, the essence to so many things that robots do. Uh, dexterous manipulation, this thing that we're so, so good at, relies on making and breaking contact, unilateral contact, we can push but not pull. Uh, but not just manipulation relies on transient, frictional, unilateral contact. Locomotion, all kinds of locomotion, legged locomotion, that's a new robot in our lab, a little snake robot that we've built. We started looking at crawling locomotion, which also contact is fundamental to all of these tasks in robotics. And I argue that understanding contact and modeling contact is one of the key problems if you're going to be good as a robot at all of these motor skills. So when I say modeling contact, what specifically do I mean? What does it mean to have a contact model? And at a very high level, a contact model means we need a way to encode how contact behaves in the real world. And contact, transient, frictional, unilateral contact, has some very distinct characteristics in how it works. And we'd like to be able to encode those behaviors as a set of constraints. And then, once we have those constraints as mathematical equations, we'd like to be able to solve systems that comprise that contact model for all kinds of problems. And let me give you a concrete example of a kind of problem that can be solved with contact modeling. This is from the field of manipulation. So let's say I have a robot hand that's holding an object, and the object is being pushed out. There's somebody pulling up. And I'm asking the question of, will this grasp resist this disturbance or not? or is the object going to come out? And that is equivalent to saying, if you have a good contact model, to saying, do there exist contact forces that obey my contact model, whatever it is? So those contact forces need to be physically believable, plausible, accurate, need to be what actually happens in the real world. And then those contact forces need to not just obey the contact model, they also need to balance the disturbance. So in this specific case, so this is a, an existence problem. You can have optimization problems as well. And the contact model is an inner core part of this question that I'm asking. And what I'd like, for example, from my model in this specific scenario is I'd like it to say, yes, you can resist that disturbance because these contact forces exist. Uh, they obey friction laws, but they will only arise if you have enough friction budget, if you've taken care to squeeze the object first. Unless you're squeezing, you're actively squeezing by applying torques at the joints, you won't have that friction budget and the object will come right out. So that's what I'd like my model to be able to predict, for example. Conversely, if somebody's saying, well, what if instead, you know, I'm pushing down into the hand, I'd like my contact model to be able to say, yes, You'll be able to resist that. You have these contact forces that obey friction laws. Furthermore, because this specific hand has joints that are not back drivable, you don't need to worry about anything in terms of actuator torques. 
whoever's pushing down on the object will be just pushing against your joints, which won't move, you're good. So these are the kinds of things that I'd like my model to be able to predict. And the critical part here is that this contact model has to encode physical behavior, what actually happens in the real world. So let's take a closer look at why that's such a hard problem. And in particular, one of the hardest things to model about contact is friction. So let's look here at the Coulomb friction model. I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with and maybe you're asking yourselves, okay, isn't that solved, known? We've had Coulomb friction for decades now, okay? So the Coulomb friction model says that you have a contact if the contact is sticking, if there's no slip, then the friction component of the force is restricted by the normal component times the friction coefficient, which essentially means that the entire contact force has to lie inside this cone. The friction component has to lie inside of the circle that's the base of your friction cone. Once things start to move, then it gets more interesting. If the contact is slipping, so there's relative motion, now Coulomb friction says that the friction force has to be as large as it possibly can, so it has to be on the edge of the circle, that's the basis of the cone, but more interestingly, it also says that friction has to dissipate as much energy as possible. This is known as the maximum dissipation principle, so whatever friction does, friction obviously cannot contribute energy to your system. That's very intuitive. But also friction in nature acts in such a way to burn as much energy as it possibly can. So not only friction force has to lie on the edge of the circle, it also has to oppose relative direction of motion in this uh, isotropic friction model. And now, once you include the maximum dissipation principle into the Coulomb friction model, this is C1 discontinuous, it's non-convex, obviously you know, non-linear, uh, and it's actually not something that we know how to solve efficiently. Once you put proper Coulomb friction with the maximum dissipation principle inside of a system of equation as a set of constraints, we have no efficient solvers for something like that because it's non-convex, uh, because it's non-smooth and non-convex. And that's been an open problem for, for a long, long time, meaning we cannot accurately model friction in, in, this, in this scenario. This blue object is just meant to be a finger that's touching uh, some object. Because I come at things from a manipulation perspective, so everything is, right? So this is, this is the finger, the robot, sort of since think of it as part of my robot. This is the object that I'm touching, and then the force applied to the finger at the contact has to lie inside of this friction cone. So, you, the force applied by the finger to the finger, the blue vector, the robot. You can, you can think of it either way, yeah, because one is the re reciprocal of the other. So you can think of it either, either as the force applied by the finger to the object or the object to the finger. Mm -hmm. The red vector is the friction component. Yes, the blue vector is the normal component. The total force has to be inside of the cone, and just the friction component has to be in, in, in a circle, which is the, the base of the cone. The friction coefficient, okay. mu. Okay. But the, the critical part here is that once you have relative movement, the friction part has to oppose the direction of movement because friction tends, needs to do as much negative work as it possibly can. So the dot product between the friction force and relative velocity has to be as small as possible. And this is the set of constraints that we don't know how to model in a way that allows for efficient solvers. So this is in, in, in 3D. We, we took a look at this problem and the first um, insight that we had was that in 2D, we can simplify it quite a bit. And in 2D, the big advantage is that 
a contact can really be in one of three states. It can be sticking, it can be slipping in one direction, or it can be slipping in the other direction. And since we're in 2D, there's only two directions for the contact to slip in. Once we consider stick as well, there's just three possible states for every contact. And we can just enumerate them. And now, this simplifies the problem because if we know what each contact is doing, whether it's sticking or slipping and in which direction, so if we know the possible state for each contact, now the problem is convex. So for every possible contact state, we have a convex problem to solve to say if there exist contact forces that obey these friction laws. The problem is that since every contact can have three possible states, if we have n contacts, we have an exponential number of total possible states given what every contact could possibly be doing. So we can enumerate them, but it's going to be exponential in the number of contacts, so it's still going to be very expensive. But if you, we take a closer look at the problem, so here's a 2D object and we have three contacts. Let's look for a second at contact number two and think about all the ways that this object could move in and what that means as far as contact two is concerned. So this object is a 2D object. We can have three possible movements, translation along X, translation along Y, or rotation, so it's three-dimensional space of possible object movements. And out of all of those possible object movements, all the ones where you have no movement along Y means that contact two sticks. So in this space of possible objects movements, X, Y, and R, this hyperplane defines those object movements where contact two sticks. And everything that's on one side of this plane will mean movement here in one direction. Everything that's on the other side of that plane will mean movement at that contact in the opposite direction. Okay? And now we can do that for every single contact. For contact one as well, there is a hyperplane of object movement. In this case, it's not a hyperplane, it's an actual plane because we're in, 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 in 2D. So there is a plane of movements that induce stick. The same for contact three. And now, if we intersect all of these planes, we get all the possible combinations of object movements and what that means for every contact. So these planes divide space into all of these cells, and each of these cells means, specifies exactly what each contact is doing, what direction it's slipping in, and any object movement that lies on one or more of these planes means that one or more of these contacts is sticking. What's R? Rotation. Is it a torque? We think of it as either virtual displacements or velocity. You can think of it as object velocities, instantaneous velocities. Okay, so in the space of all possible instantaneous object velocities, which is three dimensional, we have all of these regimes where each contact is either sticking or slipping. And we have this very simple kind of geometrical way of looking at this. Since every contact, the, the stick constraint for every contact is a plane in the space of possible object velocities. Yes? What is the dependent on the displacement and not on the forces? Sticking versus slipping, what is dependent on the displacement? We are just thinking about instantaneous, we think of virtual object, virtual displacements. It's, it's an argument that uh, has to do, with, we're, we're looking at, we're trying to reason about the forces applied and we're introducing constitutive relationships with, by modeling virtual springs. I didn't include that in here to make it a little, uh, a little simpler. But, uh, and then those forces arise as a result of virtual displacements in the object. But if, if a contact were to, if, were to slip at a certain moment in time, it means that yes, there's some force being applied that causes slip, but it also means that the object has to move in such a way that's consistent with that slip. Okay, and, and the key insight here is that the, all the ways that the object could possibly move and what that means in terms of each contact sticking or slipping, which is given by the intersection of all of those hyperplanes, 
the number of different cells that these hyperplanes partition the space in is actually not exponential in the number of contacts, is polynomial in the number of contacts. And that's a, a known result from computational geometry that a number of hyperplanes, a partition of space by a number of hyperplanes, induces a number of these regions that's polynomial in the number of hyperplanes and not exponential. And then it's, it, uh, so every one of these possible virtual object displacements that tells us how each contact behaves, uh, we can enumerate all of these uh, in also in polynomial time in the number of contacts. It turns out that every one of these regions is equivalent to a vertex in the dual polyhedron for this arrangement of hyperplanes. So now what that means is that we can enumerate all the possible things that can happen at every contact and all the things, all of those possible different regimes, we don't have an exponential number of them, we have a polynomial number of them in the number of contacts. We can compute all of them in polynomial time and then once you specify exactly what each contact is doing, whether it's sticking or whether it's slipping, then you can solve your entire system and at that point it just becomes a linear system of equations and it's, and it's trivial to solve. So at that point you can answer queries about will there arise contact forces, legal contact forces that can balance the disturbance and you can answer that question in an overall polynomial time in the number of contacts that you have. Let me, let me show you some of the kinds of, of, of results that, that, that you can get with that. So for example, if you look at this object, the, this is the object being held by a robot hand and we have three contacts and we are looking in the XY plane the forces that this grasp can resist. And the shaded region here tells us the forces applied to this object that the grasp can resist. And it tells us very intuitively that if you're pushing down and even down into the side but any force pushing down this grasp will passively be able to resist that which makes a lot of intuitive sense. If you're pushing down, you're just pushing into the grasp, you're gonna get a reaction force at this contact that will resist that, that disturbance. However, if you're pushing up, the object is gonna just simply slide out right away. There's nothing to resist that because so far we haven't told it that you're squeezing in any way. Right? If you wanted to resist a force that's trying to get the object up and out, what you need to do is squeeze. You need to somehow preload these contacts to create some initial force and then you have the friction to resist the disturbance. If you don't do that, you're not going to be able to resist any force that's pushing you up. On the other hand, if you do have, if you do tell it, look, now I'm applying some initial force at contacts one and three, so I have, I've, I've wedged the object in, then our model says that you will have some amount of resistance in the up direction and it's gonna be finite and it has to do with how hard you're squeezing and the friction coefficient. Whereas if you're pushing down, you have infinite resistance, of course until something breaks, but that's not something that, that we'd model. Yeah, so this is just forces the forces that this grasp can resist, the space of forces in the X and the Y, and the axes are the same as on the object, right? So a force in the shaded region is a force that's pushing down on the object, a force up there is a force that's pushing up, and if you're not preloading, if you're not squeezing to begin with, you can resist any force that's pushing down, but you cannot resist anything that's pushing up Whereas if you are squeezing, then you have the same amount of resistance against forces pushing down, and now you have some finite resistance against forces pushing up. And uh, this is, and in, with the, by reasoning about the possible contact states and by reasoning about exactly how those, each contact moving has to be consistent with rigid body movements of the object that you're holding, uh, we were able to solve this in, in polynomial time in the number of contacts. 
which was, which was interesting for us. Uh, this can be useful if you think about fixturing, which is oftentimes a 2D problem. But for us, it was more of a stepping stone for a better understanding of what we need to do to do a similar analysis, but in, in three dimensions. And in three dimensions, uh, this, the exact same thing doesn't apply anymore because in 2D, a contact can only slip in one of two directions, left or right. In 3D, a contact can slip in an infinite number of directions in the tangent plane uh, at, at around the contact normal. So in 3D, things get more, more complicated and we cannot apply the exact same thing. So what can we do in, in 3D? So a very common thing that we've, we've had in the field for a while is instead of using friction cones, which are nonlinear, uh, can we linearize the friction cone? So use, for example, a friction pyramid. So here is, instead of a friction cone, we have a friction pyramid. We're saying forces at the contact have to lie inside of this pyramid. If I'm looking at it from, from above or from below, this is the base of the friction pyramid. This is the circle that used to be the base of my friction cone if I had an exact formulation. And now I'm replacing it with this polygon inside of, my, uh, inside of what used to be the, the friction circle before. So this is, it's an approximation, which is good because it, it now the problem is linear. So the, 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 fric the friction component is, has a linear dependency on the normal component. It doesn't yet solve the problem that we have to model uh, friction as opposing the direction of motion. So uh, one thing that you can do once you've linearized the friction cone like this is if you look at these four, uh, we call them friction edges that define the, the polygon that you inscribe inside of your friction circle, you can express friction force as a linear combination of these four edges with positive coefficients. And if you put also a limit on the sum of the coefficients, now, this is a linear way of saying that friction has to be inside the polygon that you're approximating friction with, which is good. It doesn't yet solve the problem. Now we've said we've encoded the fact that friction has to be restricted by the friction coefficient. We haven't yet said that friction has to oppose motion. Well, let's do the same thing for the relative movement at the contact. And let's say that, there, so the, the blue arrow is friction force, the red arrow is relative movement, and here I'm actually encoding not relative movement, but the opposite of it. For, it'll become clear why in just a second. So the blue arrow is friction, the red arrow is the direction of movement at the contact, and I'm also expressing relative movement as a linear combination of the same friction edges, but this time I'm just saying it has to have positive coefficients. There is no cap because slip can be however fast it wants to be. I, I'm not constraining slip. Once I've done that, if I say that both sets of coefficients are constrained to be as part of what's called the special order set of type two, uh, this says that a special order set of type two is a set of coefficients where only two of them are allowed to be non-zero at a given time. At most, two of them are allowed to be non-zero and they have to be consecutive. So once I'm saying that both the coefficients that I use to express friction and the coefficients that I use to express relative movement have to be constrained by a, as a special order set of type two, I'm saying that both of them have to be only two two consecutive ones can be non-zero, all the other ones have to be zero. And if I'm using the same special order set to constrain both of them, now I have a set of equation that says two things. It says that friction has to be inside of this polygon, and it also says that friction and relative movement have to be in the same sector of my polygon. So I've, I've, I've gone 
a few steps towards my goal of coming up with a way to encode this constraint that friction has to oppose motion. Remember that the red arrow is the opposite of relative motion at the contact in the tangential direction. So with these constraints, I can say friction is constrained and it has to lie in the same sector of my polygon as the opposite of relative movement. Which is good, it takes me part of the way there. It's still very inexact, right? Because I'm not saying, ideally these should really be on top of each other. Now I'm just saying they have to be in the same sector of my polygon. So what can I do? I can have a more refined polygon. I can say, oh, now I know what sector both of them lie in. Why don't I further refine that sector? And now I'm requesting that friction and movement are in a tighter neighborhood together. And once I know what, where they have to be in this case, I can refine even more and I can, can continue refining this polygon more and more until I can make this sector arbitrarily small. And at that point, I'm restricting friction and movement to lie as close to each other as, as I'd want to. And why am I not just starting with a polygon that has lots and lots and lots of these edges? Because that is very expensive to solve. So these, these special order sets, they get solved as mixed integer problems, which are still uh, potentially exponential in the number of constraints. Uh, so I'd still want to have as few friction edges as possible. So instead of starting off with a polygon that has lots and lots and lots of these friction edges, I'd rather start off with a very coarse approximation, find out what friction wants to be, and then keep progressively tightening my approximation until I reach the accuracy that, that I need. Can this possibly find more than one solution? So uh, we're just, if yes, and then you can also introduce an objective. I can say what are the contact forces with the smallest joint torques that will resist this disturbance? Or what's the largest disturbance I can resist along this possible direction? So yes, in some cases, you can have more than one solution to your overall system, whatever that happens to be. So I meant more by having the relaxation, because in the initial rounds of the optimization, they would find multiple solutions they need to refine. Yes. And one of them does not refine in the way you have actual solutions. So that's a very good point. There's actually two points in there. So first of all, it's possible that at this level of uh, iteration, it tells me that this is where the solution lies, so I choose to refine this sector. But then at the next, once I do it, it might actually find a solution in here. And I'll have to refine this one as well. So in, in, in the worst case, I'll have to keep refining until I will end up with a polygon that's refined everywhere, and then I was better off just starting with a polygon that had that resolution to begin with. We've never seen that happen in practice. And we're trying to understand right now if there are theoretical reasons why, if the problem actually isn't exponential to begin with, or maybe it's just we've gotten lucky, we think that there are some theoretical reasons why it'll never happen that I need to refine everything. It'll always be targeted refinement. And then to answer your, your, your second question, is it possible that I'll find some solutions at this level of refinement that go away as I go deeper and deeper. And that's actually a very good point. And we ended up with the same observation. So let's look a little bit more at what's happening as we are increasing, refining our constraints. So as I'm refining, I am requesting that friction and movement lie closer and closer together. So tighter opposition of friction to relative movement, which m constrains the problem more and more. On the other hand, I'm giving it more friction to play with, right? The pink area here is larger than the pink area here. So there's just more friction to play with, which means that I'm making the problem less constrained. So it's entirely possible. We don't know which one of those wins, right? I'm, I'm making the problem harder in some sense by refining, but easier in some other ways. So which one of those wins? It's a tricky question. So it's entirely possible that you will have some solutions at this level of refinement that you wouldn't have had here, 
or that you'll, it's always possible. So, and, and that's something we cannot really accept. Because if there are solutions at this level that don't exist at this level, we'll never get to the high refinement level. Which is why we went to a different refinement scheme. Instead of starting with a polygon inside the exact circle, we start with a polygon that's outside. So the circle is inscribed inside the polygon. And then we do the refinement in such a way that whatever solution is available at this stage is guaranteed to also be available at this stage. Both of these schemes, right, so if you look at this one, progressively it converges to the circle from the inside. This one also converges to the circle but from the outside. And this has a very nice theoretical guarantee that if a solution exists at this level of refinement, I am guaranteed to also have it at this level. Which for us means two things. Uh, that A, will find the solution always if it exists. It also means that if at this level of refinement, my system says there's no solution, I can stop right there. I don't need to refine any further. I am guaranteed that there won't be any solution at a further level of refinement. So if I approximate my cone with very, very few friction edges and I ask, is there a solution? Is this stable or not? And with this very coarse approximation, my system says, there's no solution. Your grasp is unstable. I can just stop right there. There's no need to continue refining. I'm done. Right. So, I mean, there's two factors at play here. One is just the, the two materials, what materials we're talking about. So just the material properties of the object that will show up in the friction coefficient. So the friction coefficient is specific to the two materials that are touching each other. Yes. Okay. But, um, you know, we live in a very advanced world where, you know, look at my shirt. It's not as solid as, look at my skin. It's not as solid, right? It's deformable. So, anyway, I understand where you are coming from, but, um, um, in fact, if you go to the refiner and look at his PhD thesis, So if, if, okay. if you have... I, I just wanted to point out this because in my group we are now very much hung up on very variable stiffness material. So if you have a soft object and you have a little area of contact as opposed to the point contact... You can have also soft fingers. Yes. You, you, and, you, and you always do. You always do in robotics. There's no good reason to have rigid fingers. Uh, then you also have torsional friction, yes, of course. right? Yes. And if I add torsional friction, then my 3D cone becomes a 4D ellipsoid, and this beautiful 2D circle becomes a 3D, which, which makes it, but, but this directly extends to the soft fingers where instead it's, it's no longer, I can no longer show it on the slide, but the theory extends directly to the soft finger model. What we're not capturing is roll, the ability to apply rolling forces, which we don't really know what to do about it. Right. No, but these are still open problems. Yes. It's, yeah. Sorry. No, no, thank you.
Yes. May not be that bad in some circumstances. So, um, is there any sort of uh, versus underestimating the OCD or changing the people who prefer a more calm kind of disorder? So, I was just wondering if you. That's a good point, and we haven't thought about it in that light, and maybe we should have, right? Because, like this, because we're being conservative here, then we're guaranteed that any solution will, will have it. But maybe in real life, you want the opposite. If you only have a very small computational budget and you can only afford this level of refinement, maybe you never want to overestimate stability, but you always want to underestimate stability, just to be safe. So from that sense, coming at it from, from, from inside out is the preferable conservative choice. But this is the one that allows us the theoretical guarantees, that if there is a solution, we will find it. Maybe there's a refinement scheme that's both conservative and guarantees that you'll have the solution. That's a good, yeah, that's an interesting, we'll, we'll have to think, because there are other refinement schemes as well. We, these are just the one we tried and then the one we did, but there are other possibilities. So yeah, that's a way to think about it. Okay, so now with this, yeah, this is all the stuff that we've talked about. So. Uh, this is what it looks like in practice. We're doing this analysis and you can see the same, this 3D object being held by the hand and it's being pushed up. And this is how the friction cone gets refined. This specific region gets refined a lot up to, we'd go to I think one degree between friction edges. So very, very, very accurate uh, model. Then we started getting the results and at first we were a little bit surprised. So. This is a very similar plot to the one that I was showing earlier where what I'm showing here are forces in the xy plane that this grasp can resist. So the, orient, the force in the xy plane, anything inside the shaded region here is something that this grasp can resist. The blue is without any preload, without squeezing. Magenta is if you also add some amount of squeezing force. And we ran our model on this grasp and looked at the forces that this can resist. And the first thing that surprised us was that why is this not symmetrical? The grasp is symmetrical. Why is this not symmetrical? Why is this saying that I can resist a force like this, so pulling me like this, but I cannot resist a force like that? What's different between those two uh, conditions, right? Why is this not symmetrical? And then we realized that if you actually look at the underlying triangular meshes, because now the object is a mesh, the fingers is, are meshes. This is not symmetrical up to the mesh accuracy. There's actually slight asymmetries just because of the triangular mesh models that we use. So here's another one where I've exaggerated the difference a little bit to show you what that means. So if these two normals and these two contexts are just ever so slightly offset from each other. Now you can imagine that if I'm pulling like this, the object is going to try to pivot around this point and wedge itself in this contact. And it'll just wedge itself into the grasp and never come out. Whereas if I'm pulling like this, it'll want to pivot around this point and then come free and then just come out. So if the asymmetry is visible, then this result makes a lot of intuitive sense. I can pull like this and it'll just wedge itself, or I can pull like this and then it will come free. So here the difference is visible. Here it's not visible to the naked eye, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Again, these are triangular meshes and these contacts are just ever so slightly offset from each other in a way that gives us this dramatically different behaviors regarding which way you're, you're, you're pulling. And this goes back to your comment about nothing is actually really rigid in the world. This assumes infinitely rigid bodies. If the object is ever so slightly soft and deformable, you won't get this effect because it'll just locally deform a little bit and come out. But as far as a perfectly rigid triangular mesh goes, this is what you get, this is, this is real. So then we started saying, wait a second, this is not a bug, this is a feature, right? It's like, it reminded me of a comment of, of a news anchor who was saying that once 
HD cameras were introduced, he started having to put more makeup on his face because the HD camera was showing everything that wasn't visible before. So we think of it as this model is accurate enough to reveal, to make imperfections of the triangular meshes matter if you assume that that's exactly what the finger looks like and if you assume infinitely rigid bodies. We're trying to, well, we're trying to predict via simulation and the simulation is not wrong. The simulation is too right. It's just that the actual meshes, shapes of the fingers aren't. Yeah, but in real life, if, if you went simulate. Yeah. And you were actually doing what you want to do, would it really? It, it, because in real life. It might. It might or it might not. So first of all, if it's not very rigid, it might deform locally, which we, we're not modeling. If it is, if it's made of steel, it might or it might not, and you are at the mercy of tiny, tiny differences in contact locations and contact normals. So it's very sensitive. It's incredibly sensitive, yes. But that's an effect that you, you cannot really predict, and you don't want to be at the mercy of that. So now we would like a model that is not, that is conservative in the sense that it predicts stability even if the contact normals are off a little bit compared to what you think. So this is what we did next. So this is our constitutive model for normal forces. We're saying that the normal force is just some stiffness times any displacement of the object in the normal direction. We actually introduce some amount epsilon of uncertainty, and we're saying now you're gonna get contact forces that are as if your normal was off by a little bit, by as much as epsilon, in the worst possible case. You don't know exactly what the normals are gonna be, and you wanna be robust to changes of up to epsilon in the normal orientation. So now, if you look at the exact same grasp as before, but with this additional epsilon robustness to contact normal changes, and I think we use three degrees, now you get exactly the behavior that you'd expect, which it says it's the same to pull one, diagonally one way versus pulling diagonally the other way. So now this is a result that you can actually use in practice, and you know that you're being conservative. You're, you're guaranteed that that's the case. And these are all kinds of other types of results that we get. You're holding a flask. You're thinking, should I turn clockwise or should I turn counterclockwise if I want to pour? Where, which direction gives me more robustness to gravity? And if I turn one way, then gravity is going to evolve. It's going to go like this as I'm turning. If I'm turning the other way, gravity is going to go like that. I should be turning this way because that's how I have my force. I have better resistance to gravity forces. These are the kinds of, of, of ways that you can use this framework to predict meaningful things for, for tasks that you're trying to execute. Yes? Um, so it's kind of like the same thing to do like on the uncertainty about the angle, uh, rather than other types of activities. So uh, that we found to be the key factor in getting rid of these big asymmetries that you cannot count on. Friction coefficient, for example, which just kind of scale things but won't have the same qualitative effect. So this, this effect, whether the object wedges itself in or not, it's very discontinuous, right? As soon as one contact is ever so slightly above the other, it'll wedge itself. If it's not, it'll come loose, right? And that kind of uncertainty is not captured, for example, by the friction coefficient or anything else, but just the normal direction. Yeah, but the position of the object is, yeah, that's, we haven't, we haven't looked at that. So, uh, and then back to, to Peter's uh, uh, question from a few minutes ago, if uh, you have always a single solution. Well, what we actually have is a general model. What we're talking about here is the external force applied to the object, the actuator forces, the contact forces. And in general, you can specify some of these and solve for the other, or you can introduce objectives like what we were talking about earlier. Can you resist a specific disturbance? And if so, what are the minimum joint torques? You can use this model as part of many, many systems that you're trying to solve. 
but the underlying model of friction is, is always the same. And uh, again, to compare this to, to previous approaches for the same problem, this can, friction in general and friction opposing motion can either be a non-linear a non complementarity problem and then it's not solvable efficiently. If you approximate your friction cone with very, very high resolution to begin with, that's intractable. Uh, you can have an iterative solver that makes no guarantees. One of the things that we like the most about this is that we have very strong guarantees. We are saying if there is equilibrium, then our system will have a solution and, and vice versa. Because we have, we use global solvers for this. If you use an iterative solver, which we also did in, in our, some of our previous work at Wafer right here in San Francisco a couple of years ago, if you have an iterative solver, then you can make no guarantees, but because we have a global solver, it ends up being a mixed integer problem, then we can make strong guarantees and are computationally efficient while accounting for the maximum dissipation principle. So let me, whoa, switch gears to nothing because I have five minutes left. <laughs> um, very quickly go over some of the other work that I wanted to show you up today. I had one more project that I wanted to go into depth on and uh, now I'm just gonna stay fairly superficial on it. So completely uh, changing gears is, okay, in a real robot, where is this information going to come from? Where you're touching, where contact location is happening and that is where you need tactile sensors. So if you were to use a model like this on a real robot, you would need very good accurate tactile sensors. And tactile sensors like the ones that we'd like to have, which give you that kind of rich accurate data and can have coverage of curved surfaces and are easy to integrate into robot hands, they don't really exist yet. So we set off to build our own. Let me very quickly tell you how ours works. So I'm just gonna skip a bunch of this and go straight to 3D. So this is our tactile sensor. Uh, there's the skeleton, which is 3D printed. And on that skeleton, we have a flex board, which has a lot of LEDs and photodiodes on it. All of these are photodiodes. All of these are LED pairs. On top of that, we put a layer of about seven millimeters of soft transparent urethane, so PDMS. Uh, so you cannot really see here, but the transparent layer is about seven millimeters thick. And then we coat everything with a reflective layer of silver dust to keep light in. So now what's happening is if you imagine that, so this is the transparent PDMS, this is an LED, this is a photodiode, so light travels from the LED to the photodiode. If you touch something, then you are going to affect how light moves. So you'll get a different reading in this photodiode when you're looking at light emitted by this specific LED. But we, that also happens, you have nearby pairs. So for example, if you look at these, for, for these LEDs, right, you get light, for, for these photodiodes, you get light from here, you get light from nearby. And then depending on where you're touching, you are always changing light transport between some LEDs and some photodiodes. And then the nice thing about this is we have 30, 30 LEDs, 30 photodiodes. We do multiplexing in time, so we turn on one LED at a time, read all photodiodes, turn on another LED, read all photodiodes. So like this, we can read the light transport between every LED and every photodiode. And since there's 30 of each, we get about a thousand signals from this finger, all with very, very few, very few wires. This is the one and only wire coming out of this finger. And wiring is the death of the roboticist. Any robotics project comes down to if you can wire it or not. So this is why we were jumping for joy when this was it. That's the only wire coming out of this finger. And it give us, gives us tactile coverage of these complex round surfaces. But there is still a matter of, okay, you're getting a thousand signals and that those thousand signals change when the finger gets poked, but how do they change? You still need to extract meaningful information out of that mess of a thousand signals. Uh, and the way we do that is it's a, it's a fairly simple uh, regression problem, for example. So we collect labeled training data 
that's our finger. And we have a, a UR5 with a linear probe and with a four cell. And we poke our finger in very, very controlled fashion. And now we can collect labeled training data where we know exactly where the finger is being touched and we know exactly the magnitude of the force. Then we found out that there's actually an instance of previous work from a galaxy far, far away, a long, long time ago. But, so let me skip the numerical results because we don't have time. Let me show you qualitatively. So this is the kind of thing you can do where you can predict the location of the touch, you can learn to predict the location of the touch, you can learn to predict the magnitude of the force. Uh, the underlying regressor is, uh, is uh, very simple, just a fully connected uh, deep neural network. Uh, so, and we can localize touch with very, very good accuracy. One of the catches at this point is that it's just touched in a single place because our training data is just for single touch. And what about multi-touch? Uh, so there's a couple of answers to multi-touch. In order to train for multi-touch, you'd have to collect training data. So maybe now you need two robots poking, but then maybe you need three robots poking. The motion planning gets hard. Maybe we can find a way to use single-touch data to train a multi-touch neural network. We're trying to get creative with the loss functions there, seeing if there's something we can do. So we're, we're actively working on it. Even with single touch, these fingers are convex. If the object is locally convex, you will touch the object in just one place. So it boils down, though, to a more basic question, which is what are you doing with your tactile data? And oddly enough, this is a question that is not really well answered right now. There's a lot more work on creating tactile data than there is on using tactile data. So one way is to get your raw data, infer location, use our analytical model, and come up with some actions that's certainly valid. But of course, this day and age, there's always the possibility of just doing end-to-end -end sensory motor learning. In which case, you don't need this intermediate labels of where the object is being touched. You are never training for that. You are just doing end-to-end -end learning, and this is something that we're, we're, we're very much trying right now we have this new hand that we've built, which is now, the, the former is now ready as well, which does have tactile sensors, our tactile sensors everywhere, and it has torque sensors at every single joint. So we think of it as the most sensorized dextrous robot hand there is, and this is our platform for motor learning. We're gonna do both, both model-based, model-free approaches, and uh, this is kind of one of our main workhorses right now. So let me jump over everything that I didn't have time to cover today. We're getting into snake locomotion as well, which was a, w a good uh, excuse for me to show some, some cool GIFs of snakes locomoting in different regimes with different friction models, which also boils down to a good contact model with friction, especially for a snake on land. And we are comparing different trajectory generators, RRT, ILQG, PPO from various families and very interesting behavior, which one works better in under which conditions. So I'd be more than happy to talk more about this offline. Uh, but with that, just thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>